Cycle Combiners to Sector MPC at back. And this is in joint work with uh, Sai Krishna, Ayush, Nathan, and Amit. Um, but common to both these talks is um, understanding two notions that we are all familiar with, which is uh, function encryption and secure MPC. And we're going to explore techniques to uh, um, construct both function encryption, in the intersection of both function encryption and secure uh, MPC. Um, we're going to see how to use constructions in one area to achieve constructions in the other area. Okay? So let me start by um, giving uh, the preliminary background on function encryption. Um, so for most of the talk, I'm going to stick to public key function encryption. Um, FE is a generalization of uh, standard public key encryption that uh, additionally has a key generation algorithm. Um, the, what the key generation algorithm allows you to do is generate functional keys associated with uh, circuits in such a way that if you have a ciphertext corresponding to encryption of some message, say X, then if you, you can use the uh, functional key associated with the circuit C to obtain C of X. So functional encryption gives more fine-grained access to uh, encrypted data. Uh, in the case of standard public key encryption, either you can get the whole message or nothing. Um, and the security guarantee roughly says the following. Um, the adversary is allowed to uh, submit challenge uh, message query x0 and x1. And he's also allowed to submit functional queries corresponding to circuit C1 through CQ. And the challenger responds back with either encryption of uh, X0 or encryption of X1. And the challenger also gives functional keys associated with the circuit C1 through CK, CQ. Okay? And the goal of the, the game is for the adversary to be able to distinguish between these two uh, experiments. Okay? So as stated, this doesn't make sense because the adversary could query a circuit that outputs different values on both X0 and X1. So we need to uh, impose an additional restriction that the output of all the circuits on messages X0 should be the same as the output of all the circuits on message X1. Okay? And moreover, we also require that the length of X0 should be the same as the length of X1. Okay? Okay? So FE in the past few years has found uh, many applications in cryptography and beyond. Uh, for instance, FE was used to construct indistinguishability obfuscation. It has been used to construct delegation schemes, uh, public key watermarking schemes, hardness of finding a Nash equilibrium, lower bonds for differential privacy, and so on. And last but not the least, it's also useful for constructing secure multi-party computation protocols. Okay. Um, so what is secure MPC? Um, all of you already know this, but it doesn't hurt to recall. Uh, secure MPC is this remarkable notion that allows uh, multiple parties each with their each party has its own private input and they want to come together and jointly compute a function on their private inputs okay? and in terms of security guarantee what we want is even if the adversary is able to corrupt a subset of the parties how he should be able to learn are the inputs of the corrupted parties okay? and the output and nothing else And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the goal of both the talks will be to explore the techniques that line intersection between these two notions. And there have already been some works that have uh, studied uh, at the intersection. Uh, so for instance, in 2012, GVW showed how to construct uh, bounded collision secure function encryption schemes, um, starting with the honest majority MPC protocol of BGW. And a few years back, there was also construction of uh, non-interactive MPC in the reusable correlated randomness model from a generalization of uh, FE called multi-input function encryption. And recently, uh, we also uh, saw how to construct combiners for function encryption using two-round MPC protocols. Yeah. Okay, so, and both the works sort of continue this line of uh, research direction. Yeah. Okay, so let me start with the first part, which is Oh, what happened? Was this only this slide or have been talking this all while? Oh, only this slide? Yeah, only this slide. Okay. 
Um, it would have been funny if I had continued throughout and then you pointed to me in the end. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to talk about optimal bounded collision secure FE scheme, and this is in joint work with Vinod. So recall that I uh, define the security of the FE scheme where the adversary can make Q functional query, right? So what is this Q, right? Um, a natural question to ask is, how do the parameters of the FE scheme grow with Q? And in particular, I'm going to focus on the encryption complexity of, an, uh, of the FE scheme in terms of Q. Um, as we will see soon, uh, this is not an artificial question, and it has some important implications in cryptography. Oh. OK. It's moving here, but not there. Uh, what's going on? Just a second. Oh, OK. OK. So. I'm going to uh, plot the schemes from on this scale. On the left-hand side, you have FE schemes that, um, that have em encryption complexity that grows polylogarithmic in Q. And on the right-hand side, you have uh, FE schemes with encryption complexity that grow polynomial in Q. Uh, and for now, just ignore the multiplicative factors in polynomial in the security parameter. Um, uh, what's going on? Uh, that's what's happening. Am I pressing something? Okay. Okay. Um, hopefully, this won't happen again. Okay. So on one hand, on one extreme, we have FE schemes that grow polynomially in Q. And we call these schemes uh, bounded key FE schemes. Um, bounded key FE schemes have some limited applications, but are still useful for interesting, uh, uh, to construct interesting primitives, such as public key watermarking schemes. And we know a lot about how to construct such schemes. I mean, we know how to construct it from standard assumptions, such as uh, DDH, LWE, and so on. And on the other extreme, we have uh, schemes that grow up logarithmic in Q, and we call such schemes collision-resistant FE schemes. Um, these schemes are even more powerful than bounded KFE schemes. They have a lot more interesting applications. But the drawback is that we only know how to construct these schemes from newer assumptions. And the reason is because this implies uh, indistinguishability obfuscation. Uh, if you want to know more about how to construct these schemes from newer assumptions, attend Rachel's talk on Wednesday. Um, and what, there is a lot to be known in the middle. And in the past few years, uh, there have been works to uh, understand better how the schemes in the middle look like. Uh, and very recently, it was shown that if you have a public key FE scheme with encryption complexity that is sublinear in Q, then that is as, okay. Then that is, okay. Okay, then that is as powerful as uh, FE schemes that grow polylogarithmic in Q, uh, meaning that um, an FE scheme with encryption complexity sublinear in Q already gives you collision resistant FE scheme. Okay. So then the whole part on the left uh, implies indistinguishability obfuscation, and so we still don't know how to construct this from standard assumptions. Okay. What about the situation on the right? Um, in, in 2012, GVW gave the first construction of bounded key FE scheme. Um, they showed how to construct FE for uh, polynomial size circuits from uh, weak PRFs in NC1. And currently, we only know how to construct weak PRFs in NC1 from standard assumptions. And, uh, but for NC1 circuits, they showed how to construct uh, FE schemes from the minimal assumption of public key encryption. Um, but the drawback in this scheme was that the encryption complexity was uh, Q to the 4. Okay. And there have been efforts to reduce this dependence on Q since then. Uh, so a couple of years back, uh, Shweta and Alon showed how to uh, achieve encryption complexity that was quadratic in Q from learning with error assumption. Okay. So now we have these two sections. What about the middle? Um, so we didn't know whether 
the FE schemes with encryption complexity linear and Q was in the red region or in the green region. Okay. And in this work, we show that, uh, that, that uh, linear complexity is actually in the green region. Okay. So we show that assuming uh, public key encryption, which is the minimal assumption, uh, there exists a public key FE scheme uh, for polynomial size circuits with encryption complexity that is linear in Q. Okay. Um, as an added advantage, that scheme also satisfies adaptive security. Uh, adaptive security just says that the adversary can query the uh, the functional can make the functional queries in an ad adaptive manner. Okay. And moreover, our construction makes uh, black box use of public key encryption. So our work establishes a dichotomy in functional encryption. So if you can construct a functional encryption scheme that, um, oh, this should have been opposite. So if you can construct a, a functional encryption scheme that, grow, that is sublinear in Q, then that would imply IO. And we show that if you can get a FE scheme that grows linearly in Q, that is equivalent to public key encryption. And as I said earlier, uh, the previous best known result achieved FE with encryption complexity that was quadratic in Q. And this was only selectively secure and from learning with errors. OK. Uh, yeah, so it was only selectively secure and from learning with errors assumption. Um, so we improve the state of the art in, in, in three ways. First is we improve the encryption complexity. Second, we get adaptive security as against selective. And moreover, we get it from the minimal assumption of public key encryption. Okay. Okay. So we also give a construction of private key functional encryption. Um, private key FE is just an adaptation of public key FE in the private key setting. Um, so the setup algorithm now only outputs the master secret key, and the encryption algorithm now needs the master secret key in order to compute the ciphertext. Okay. And we showed that assuming one-way functions, again, this is a minimal assumption, we get a private key fee scheme for polynomial size circuits with encryption complexity that grows linearly in Q. And again, we get adaptive security and we make black box use of one-way functions. And in last TCC, um, there was a construction of a private key FE scheme in the bounded key setting that had linear complexity, but that was only selectively secure, and it was from learning with error assumption. OK. so. For the next, rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on constructing public key FE schemes. Um, the construction can be very naturally adapted to the private key setting as well. OK, yeah. okay. so the first step, we are going to use public key encryption to construct a bounded key FE scheme that has large encryption complexity, meaning that it has encryption complexity that is uh, arbitrary polynomial in Q. Yeah. Recall that. Uh, GVW only constructed such a scheme from uh, weak PR of sin NC1, and we show how to get it from public key encryption. Okay. And in the second step, we give a generic construction to go from uh, FE schemes with large encryption complexity to FE schemes with linear uh, encryption complexity, meaning that the complexity only grows linearly in Q. And for the first step, we are going to use uh, techniques uh, from uh, secure MPC literature. And the second step is going to be really simple, and it's only going to use elementary tools. Okay. So let me focus on the easier step, which is the second step. Um, and we're going to see how to achieve this. And I'm going to call the, the FE scheme with large encryption complexity to be the inner scheme, and uh, the FE scheme with linear comp uh, complexity to be the outer scheme. Um, and in terms of notation, I'm going to use uh, small letters to denote the inner scheme and uh, capital letters to denote the outer scheme. Okay? And the, in terms of uh, uh, the query bound, I'm going to use T to denote the query bound for the, one, for the inner scheme 
and Q to be the query bound for the outer scheme. Okay. So this is the notation I'm going to use. Okay, so the main idea in this construction is repetition. Okay, so I'm going to take the inner scheme and repeat it many times. Okay, how many times? Q times. Okay, so I'm going to, once I do this, I'm going to get Q public keys and Q secret keys. So this is going to be my setup. And to encrypt, I again repeat. I encrypt my input uh, with respect to all these different public keys. Um, Small pk denotes the public key of the inner scheme, and capital PK denotes the public key of the outer scheme. So note that I'm encrypting the same message under all these different instantiations. And what is the key generation algorithm? Uh, I'm going to pick a random in index from 1 through Q, and I'm going to generate a key uh, for uh, corresponding to the master secret key associated with this index. So I'm going to generate the key for C corresponding to MSKI. Okay. Is the scheme clear? So decryption is easy. Um, so I have the ith functional key. I'm going to look at the ith ciphertext. I'm going to ignore everything else. And I'm going to decrypt both of them to get C of x. Okay. So the correctness just follows from the correctness of the inner scheme. Okay, um, why is this efficient? Why does this satisfy linear uh, encryption complexity? So note that I'm repeating this Q times. So the complexity is Q times poly in lambda S. S is just the size of the circuit C. And uh, recall that T was the query bound for the inner scheme. Right? So this is going to be the complexity. So all I'm going to do is set T to be security parameter. So then the complexity will now become Q times polynomial and lambda and S. So all I did was take an FE scheme that had a large encryption complexity, set the bound to be small, and use this to get an FE scheme with linear uh, complexity with a large uh, query bound. Okay. Okay. okay, security is really simple, so let me explain this with this uh, example. Suppose let's say you have Q buckets and Q balls, and you're going to place uh, every ball independently in a random bucket. Okay. So this is easy to see that the probability that any bucket has at least lambda balls is going to be negligible in the security parameter, right? Okay. So why is this example useful? Should really think of the buckets as being ciphertext. And the action of placing every ball independently in a random bucket to be the key generation algorithm. Okay. Is this clear why it's such a case? Every bucket is a separate uh, instantiation of the inner scheme. Right? And uh, picking a random in instance is the same as picking the random bucket to put the ball in. Yeah. Uh, oh, something is going wrong. Oh, finally. Okay, um, so with this analogy, it's easy to see that the probability that uh, for every index uh, from 1 through Q, the number of uh, invocations of the key generation algorithm of the inner scheme is at most T. The probability of this event is negligible in the security parameter. Yeah, this just follows from Chernoff and union bound. Okay. So why is this claim useful? So now this shows that all the Q instantiations of the inner scheme are secure. Oh, it's still not working. Thanks. Did I do something? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Oh, okay. Okay. So this shows that all the Q instantiations of the inner scheme are secure. If all the instantiations are secure, then this, the security of the outer scheme should also hold. Okay. That's it. Okay, so this completes uh, the second step. So let me talk about the first step, which is to construct a public key FE with large encryption complexity from public key encryption. Okay. As before, um, I'm going to use the terminology of inner scheme and outer scheme. 
So I'm going to break the first step into two parts. First, I'm going to uh, start with a public key single TFE scheme for poly size circuits. Uh, we know how to construct this from public key encryption. And we are going to use this uh, scheme to get public key FE for, um, for, for polynomial size circuits in the bounded key setting. Okay? And the encryption complexity of uh, this is going to be large in terms of Q. That's okay because we have already shown how to go from that to linear complexity in the first time. Okay, so I'm going to call the single key FE scheme to be the inner scheme and the, the, the one with the large encryption complexity to be the outer scheme. Uh, so in terms of notation, I'm going to denote the, the single key FE scheme to be one FE scheme. And I'm again going to use small letters for the inner scheme and uh, capital letters for the outer scheme. Okay, so to construct this um, bounded key FE scheme, a natural idea is to just repeat whatever we did in the first step, right? But we are going to instantiate the inner scheme with single key FE scheme. Okay? So we are going to again repeat the uh, inner scheme Q times, encrypt it, encrypt the same message under all the, all the ciphertext, right? And then for key generation, I'm gonna pick an index at random and give a key, okay? Okay, so now this no longer work, works because note that I'm starting with a single key FE scheme. What does this mean? It means that even if the adversary gets two keys corresponding to an instantiation, then the security of that instantiation no longer holds. Okay? And in this case, even if you take two keys, the probability of an adversary obtaining two keys with respect to the same instantiation of the inner scheme is at least one over Q. Okay? So this is not good enough. So this is where the intuition of GVW is helpful. So they used a secure MPC protocol to achieve privacy amplification. So their intuition was as follows. So treat every invocation of the underlying inner scheme as a party in a secure MPC protocol. Okay? And if you're issuing at least two keys for the ith invocation, then that particular instantiation is insecure and treat this as a corrupted party in the NPC protocol. Okay? So with this intuition, they construct the, uh, the scheme as follows. Uh, so Recall that they show how to construct a bounded KFE scheme for NC1 circuits from public key encryption. So now I'm going to start with many, many instantiations of the inner single KFE scheme. Um, but instead of encrypting the same message under all the instantiations, I'm going to secret share this uh, message uh, into, uh, into many shares. And then uh, every instantiation is used to encrypt one of the shares. And what kind of secret sharing scheme I use? I'm going to use a threshold secret sharing scheme, okay? um, where the threshold is set to be t, and I, I'll use t out of, oh, it's again not working. Um, oh, I didn't even realize it was not there. Um, oh, okay. Oh, I think you missed the, did you guys see this slide? Oh, okay, that was, my, I didn't realize, okay. Because it's showing up here, but not there. Um, okay, so, so this is the main intuition as to how uh, the bounded KFE scheme, um, how GVW actually um, um, considered different invocations of the FE scheme uh, as corresponding to uh, different parties in the MPC protocol. Okay. Okay, so, the scheme constructed by GVW is as follows. Um, so they start with a message X, and then they secret share this X into multiple shares, and then they encrypt each uh, share using an instantiation of the one FE scheme. So earlier I used Q instantiations, but now I'm going to use N instantiations, where N is an arbitrarily uh, large polynomial in, the, in Q. And for key generation, what I'm going to do is uh, consider a circuit G that homomorphically evaluates on the secret shares. So threshold uh, secret share scheme has this property that you can hom do homomorphic computations on the secret shares. So I'm going to use this property there. And I'm going to generate the functional keys corresponding to these circuits 
Uh, and these functional keys will be with respect to the inner scheme. Okay? So I'm going to pick a subset of the instantiations of the single key scheme, and I'm going to uh, uh, generate functional keys for these circuits. Okay? And the, in the, during the decryption phase, um, once you decrypt these functional keys uh, with the ciphertext in the encryption scheme, so you will end up with the output of the circuits on the secret shares. Right? So you can run the linear reconstruction algorithm to recover the output C of X. Okay. Yeah. And the reason this only works for NC1 is because you can only perform homomorphic evaluation uh, using low degree polynomials on these shares. Yeah. And our approach is to not start with BGW. So if you had looked at the previous scheme closely, um, implicit in the construction was a two-round BGW protocol. So instead of using BGW, our observation is to use BMR. Uh, and the advantage of BMR is it allows you, if you adapt it suitably, you get a two-round uh, MPC protocol from BMR for, uh, for polynomial size circuits as against just NC1. Okay. So roughly, uh, BMR looks as follows. Uh, every party does some PRG computation, okay? and the output of this PRG computation is fed into uh, a two-round information theoretic secure MPC protocol that is, uh, that's only for low-degree polynomials. And every party at the end of this protocol will recover gobbling of the circuit being securely computed uh, on the inputs x1 through xn then they run the evaluation algorithm on this gobbling scheme to recover C of X1 through X. Okay. okay, so how are we going to use BMR to construct an FE scheme? And roughly, this is how the construction is going to look, at, look like. Okay. So you go, you're going to generate the first round messages of the MPC protocol. Okay. And you're going to view the N instantiations as N parties. Okay. So Throughout this talk, the analogy would be between every instantiation and every party in the MPC protocol. Okay, so the ith message will be encrypted under the ith instantiation. Okay, um, so you will end up with n. If you started with an n party protocol, you'll end up with n ciphertext, uh, and each ciphertext is computed with respect to the inner scheme. And in the key generation algorithm, you again give a key gi key for uh, a function GI that computes the second round messages of the MPC protocol. Okay? And again, you're going to pick a subset of uh, the instantiations and give functional keys corresponding to these instantiations. Okay? And what does the decryption do? Um, so during the decryption phase, you're going to use these keys of the inner scheme and ciphertext of the inner scheme, decrypt both of them to get the gobbling of the, uh, the, the circuit C and along with the input X. Once you get the gobbling, you can decode to recover the output. So, oh, is the scheme clear, by the way? So is this secure? And the claim is that this is not secure, and the reason is because, suppose let's say I give you two functional keys corresponding to one ciphertext. So, Using the same ciphertext, you obtain two gobble circuits. Okay? But the randomness for this gobbling scheme is already fixed as part of the ciphertext, which means that you have computed both these gobble circuits using the same randomness. Okay? And this is no longer secure. Okay? So our idea is, is to use a correlated gobbling scheme that guarantees security of uh, gobble circuits even if they are computed with the same randomness. Okay. Okay. So you might think that this is sort of easy to construct because I can think of this random string as being a long block and then chop it into many blocks and I use the first block to compute gobble circuit for, for the first circuit, second block for gobbling the second circuit and so on. But I really want this construction to be a stateless transformation. So each gobbling algorithm does not know uh, what the other gobbling algorithm is doing. Okay, okay even if you, you want a stateless construction, there is actually a simple solution for this. You know, use PRFs. Right? Uh, you can think of the random string as being just a PRF key, and then you generate the randomness for this, and 
for, for every circuit, you generate fresh randomness and generate gobble circuits with respect to this fresh randomness, right? However, the PRF solution doesn't work because we really want the gobbling algorithm to be computable by low degree polynomial. Okay? And this is necessary for our construction because we are going to run an information theoretic MPC protocol for the gobbling algorithm. And that's why this has to be low degree. Okay? And we show that there exist correlated gobbling schemes from one way functions. And once uh, you have this primitive, uh, instead of getting a standard gobbling scheme, you get a correlated gobbling scheme from this MPC protocol. And then you, you, we use this to obtain construction of an FE scheme. Um, the only difference between the previous construction and this construction is that uh, after decryption, you obtain a, a correlated gobbling of the output. Right? OK, is this clear? And the security of this scheme essentially follows from the security of the single key scheme and the security of the correlated gobbling scheme. Okay, so if so, I'm going to conclude. Um, so we show how to construct bounded key FE schemes from minimal assumptions. Uh, uh, we get uh, adaptive security and black box and make black box use of crypto. And as I mentioned earlier, this establishes dichotomy in the complexity of FE schemes. Um, Previously, there was also a dichotomy established for identity-based encryption. Um, so a natural question to ask is whether there's a dichotomy for AB. Okay? So AB lies in between IB and FE, but there doesn't seem to be any dichotomy for AB. So it sort of is very surprising as to why it is the case. Okay, okay. do you have any questions before I go to the second part? Uh, is the construction uh, black box also in the use of uh, PRG or PRF uh, that you are using? Um, yeah. We use PRG, so it's black box. It's, uh, we only make black boxes of crypto. Uh, isn't the BMR uh, construction non-black box, uh, the use of PRG? No. 